and you are uh, free to start. Thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation. I will share my screen now. So can you see my share my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So welcome everybody to my presentation. As you know, most of the recent mediatic coverage on Russian LNG has been heavily focused on the uh, exports and the commercial side. Today, I would like to talk about the uh, technical perspective and the many challenges that we'll be facing the Russian LNG industry in the coming years. So I will give you an overview of the current production capacity as well as the projects under construction and the planned projects. We will review the impact of the sanctions. Uh, we'll share with you a simplified flow diagram of uh, Novatec Arctic Cascade, then the clue co conclusion followed by questions. Please note that uh, in this uh, presentation, I, we will talk only about a uh, project with a capacity above half a million tons per annum. So currently, Russia has four LNG plants in operation, Sakhalin 2, Yamal LNG, Vysotsk LNG, and Portovaya LNG. Let's start with the oldest uh, train, which is Sakhalin 2, with the 9.6 million ton uh, per annum capacity. The initial consortium was led by Marathon Oil, McDermott, Mitsubishi, and Mitsui. Uh, after that, in 1992, Shell joined the joint venture. Marathon Oil and McDermott withdrew from the project. The FID was approved in 2003 with the initial investment of 10 million, uh, 10 billion dollars, sorry, plus the uh, option for phase two. In 2006, the consortium was forced to sell uh, a majority stake to Gazprom, and the first loading happened in March 2009. After uh, February 2022, Shell announced it will leave the project, and recently. At the end of this year, Novatec uh, expressed its intention to join the venture. Geran Tokyo Gas signed long-term contract in August. So for the technical features of uh, Sakhalin 2, it's a two train of 4.8 million ton per annum using Shell DMR liquefaction technology. The compression drive is the 87 megawatt frame seven, storage capacity two tanks, and the production is supplied from three uh, gravity-based structure offshore production platforms. The estimated investment for phase one and phase two is around $20 billion. The EPC was done by Chiyoda and Toyo, and 98% of the production is on long-term basis, mostly to Japanese buyers. Yamal LNG, the largest project so far, with 17.4 MTPA. So the first gas was discovered in 1974. Initially, it was a partnership between Gazprom, Shell, and Repsol. However, with the support from the government, Novatec took control of the project in 2009. Total joined in 2011, followed by CNPC China in the 2013. The FID was approved in 2013 as well. And the EPC contract was awarded to Technip, JGC, and Chiyoda. In 2017, the delivery of the first ice-breaking LNG carrier, uh, Christophe de Margerie. In, as well, in the same year, uh, Train 1 started commercial operations, followed by, uh, followed by Train 2 and Train 3 in 2018. And 2021, Train 4 started operations. The technical features of uh, Yamal LNG, three trains of 5.5 million tons using the uh, air product C3 MR technology, plus a prototype uh, train of 0.9 MTPA using Novatec Arctic Cascade, which we'll talk about uh, later. The compression drive like Sakhalin is the 87 megawatt frame seven, two uh, turbine per train, storage capacity four tanks, 208 onshore wells for an estimated investment of $27 billion and a fleet of 15 Arc-7 ice-breaking LNG carriers. Shareholders for Yamal are Novatec, Total, CNPC, and the Silk Road Fund from China. And 95% 95, 95 of the production is sold on long-term contract. The smallest uh, project here, the Vysotsk LNG from Novatec. So a single train with two parallel liquefaction units using uh, air liquid smart fin liquefaction technology. 
The compression drive is the American uh, solar gas turbine, the Titan 250. Small storage capacity, as you can see. The feedstock is from the unified gas distribution system in Russia. The EPC was done by German TGE. And the commissioning happened in uh, 2018, as well as the startup. Uh, recently, a cargo from Vysotsk LNG was used for the commissioning and startup of Hamina LNG in Finland. Next project is Portovaya LNG from Gazprom with a capacity of 1.5 million tons per annum, a single train with two parallel liquefaction units like uh, Vysotsk LNG, using Linde, German, Lehman 3 liquefaction technology. Compression drive is the uh, frame 5D with 32 megawatt. Storage capacity, a small onshore tank, plus a floating storage unit, the Porto V. The feedstock is from the Nord, Nord Stream 1 uh, gas pipeline. The EPC was completed by a Russian firm Patton, and the startup happened in uh, September 22. So what about the project under construction? Of course, the elephant in the room is uh, Arctic LNG2 with 19.8 million tons per annum capacity. So the feed was completed by Technip in 2018, FID approved in 2019. The EPC contract uh, for the process side of the project was awarded to Technip. In 2021, 56 wells were completed, which is enough to supply uh, one train. And in 2022, it was announced as a result of the sanction that uh, train one startup was delayed to next year because uh, towing will happen in August and the launch of the first train is expected to happen in December 2023. So the technical features for Arctic LNG2, three trains of 6.6 .6 million tons per annum using uh, the Linde MFC4 technology. The compression drive will be the latest from uh, Baker Hughes, the LM9000, which is an aeroderivative gas turbine. Storage capacity, six LNG tanks. The EPC process, again, uh, by Technip and Nipi Gas, and the EPC for the gravity-based structures from Italy's Saipan and Turkish Renaissance. Shareholders, Novatec, Total Energy, CNPC, and Japanese Mitsui and Jogmec. Part of the project includes the construction of two transshipment hubs using uh, two FSUs of a capacity of 360,000 cubic meter each, which is the largest uh, capacity ever for uh, LNG storage floating, one in uh, near Murmansk and the other one on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Also, it includes the construction of 21 Arc 7 carriers, 15 with Samsung and participation of uh, Russian yard Zvezda, and six with Deu. The Ustluga LNG project with the Gazprom, 13 MTPA, two trains of 6.5 million tons using German Linde MFC technology. The compression drive will be the Mitsubishi dual shaft 120 megawatt H100. The feedstock is from the Russian unified gas distribution system. The EPC was supposed to be a Linde and Renaissance for a capex of $9.5 billion. Arctic LNG-1, similar configuration and similar capacity to Arctic LNG-2. The pre-feed was completed by Technip for an expected FID in 2024. There is also potential for Arctic LNG-3 and or two additional trains for Arctic LNG-2. All, the, all these, those, those details are, of course, before uh, February 2022. Opsky LNG from Novatec again two trains of 2.5 uh, million tons per annum using Novatec Arctic Cascade. Again, the compression drive was supposed to be the 33 megawatt SGT 700 for Siemens, from Siemens. The feed was completed by Nipigaz. The EPC contra contractor was uh, French Vinci for an expected FID in the uh, first half of next year. A GBS configuration as well for a capex of $7 billion. The Far East LNG, 6.2 million ton train, uh, based on the air product C3MR technology. The developer were ExxonMobil, Rosneft, India ONGC, and Japanese Sodico. For a capex of 9 billion, the feedstock was supposed to be from Sakhalin 1. The feed was completed by Technip and JGC in 2021. However, after the invasion of Ukraine, ExxonMobil withdrew from the consortium in April of this year. The Yakutia LNG project, two trains of 6.5 million tons per annum. 
the Tamir LNG, four trains of 7.5 million ton per annum developed by Rosneft. Recently, Trafigura and Vitol announced that they will be leaving the project. The Stockman LNG, single train from Gazprom with a 7.5 million ton capacity. The Anabar Nefte Gaz, single train with 7.5 million ton again. The Kara LNG, four train of 7.5 million ton developed by Rosneft, British Petroleum and the Qatar Investment Authority. So what is the impact of the sanction of the, on the existing facilities? As you know, in the recent month, uh, most service and support contracts with the Western Front were terminated. Uh, American and European sanctions have prohibited the supply of technology and equipment to the Russian Federation, including for the uh, LNG sector. So we're talking about Baker Hughes, the gas turbines and compressors, Siemens, the power generation gas turbines and BOG compressors, Air Products, uh, Linda, Shell, uh, technical support for the uh, liquefaction technology, GTT from France for the containment system for the storage of LNG, ABB, and many others. So what are the alternatives? As we have seen in uh, Yamal LNG train for, we have seen a flurry of new, uh, new players, Russian uh, companies. Most of them are coming from the nuclear industry or the space industry, and they, they benefit from uh, very strong uh, state support. You have uh, Africanto for LNG pumps, the Kazan compressor match for the gas turbines, up to 32 megawatt and BOG compressors, cryogen mash for the cryogenic heat exchanger for the nitrogen expander, Podolsk for the unflash vessels, Turbonasos for the LNG expander. This one is coming from the Federal Space Agency and Zvezda. Although Zvezda yards had no previous uh, LNG carriers ex building experience, they have been as associated with uh, Samsung to build those. And what about the impact of the sanctions on Arctic LNG2? So as of uh, November 2022, completion reached 72%. So uh, Linda, Saipam and Baker Hughes have left the project. The key EPC contractor for the process side technique is exiting the project in the first half of next year. A new contracting company have been created green energy solutions in the UAE and Nova Energies in the Russian Federation. Uh, Korean Daewoo terminated contract for two ARC-7 carriers that was uh, supposed to be delivered to Sofcom flood. Some Chinese yards halted modules construction and delayed shipping. Uh, Japanese Jogmak, however, and the Mitsui uh, expressed the intention to stay in the, on board the project and external funding has been suspended. So to better understand the impact, the real impact and practical impact on the on the such a large project like Arctic LNG2, let's have a look at the, the case of the gas turbines. So uh, each train suppose, is supposed to have seven gas turbines. This is the LM9000 from Baker Hughes. This is a 73.5 megawatt aeroderivative gas turbine. So out of seven, three uh, for gas, uh, for uh, power generation and four, for refrigeration compressors in a dual string, uh, parallel string configuration. So what's happened? As of now, only five uh, units were delivered. So four units plus one spare. So the decision has been taken to keep two uh, LM9000 for power generation and two to run a single compressor uh, string. That means at best with this configuration, as you can see, at best, uh, GBS-1 or Train-1 will be able to uh, produce slightly above 50% of its 6.6 uh, uh, MTPA production capacity. So what are the main technical challenges for the startup of Train-1? There is no equivalent to the Baker Hughes LM9000 gas turbines in terms of power and size. Uh, remember, this is, we are talking about modular construction, so size is very important. There is also no replacement uh, electric motors, variable frequency drive in the 70 megawatt range that could replace those gas turbines. Uh, there are plans to secure floating power plant in the 400 megawatt range, but uh, the deal has not been finalized with the Turkish company Car Powership. Uh, there is no more support from licensor Linda for the MFC4 liquefaction technology. 
and also towing the gravity-based structure from Belo Kamenka Yard to the Gidan Peninsula without Western support will be a big issue. So the only alternative now in the Russia, for the Russian LNG industry is Novatek Arctic Cascade, which has been tried and tested at the Yamal LNG train for. So what's the Arctic Cascade? I will share with you a simplified flow diagram of this uh, process. So it has two cooling circuits, uh, ethane and nitrogen. We start with the liquid ethane accumulator. It is distributed to five uh, ethane vaporizer at 30 bar, reduced to 70 bar, and uh, you obtain a minus 12 uh, degrees temperature. Second uh, stage, eight bar, minus 37 degrees. Third stage, 4.3 bar, minus 56 degrees. Fourth stage, 2.2 bar, minus 72 degrees by expansion. And the last stage at one bar. So vapors are recompressed in five stages, compressors, and sent back and condensed in the liquid FN accumulator. For the nitrogen uh, loop, nitrogen is supplied at 100 bar. To the top of the cryogenic heat exchanger, it is cooled down to minus eight, then sent through the first uh, FN vaporizer at minus 10, sent back to the cryogenic heat exchanger at minus 32 degrees to minus 35, send back again to the third bundle, minus 51 to minus 55, to the fourth bundle, minus 67 to minus 71, and to the fifth bundle, minus 81 to minus 85 degrees, then expansion to minus 140 uh, degrees Celsius to provide the cooling duty through the cryogenic heat exchanger, the vapor are recompressed again and sent back to the loop. Speed gas is supplied at 100 bar and cooled down to minus 10 in the first ethane vaporizer, then minus 35, minus 55, minus 71, and then minus 85. Then it is cooled down to minus 138 in the bottom bundle of the cryogenic heat exchanger, expanded to uh, two bar at minus 154 degrees Celsius and flash vessel pumped to storage at eight bar and minus 154 degrees Celsius. So the conclusion, there are no sanctions so far on the purchase of Russian LNG, and I don't expect them to, to be coming. There has been significant increase of Europe purchase of LNG from Novatec Yamal LNG. Novatec is far ahead of Gazprom in terms of production and projects. There has been significant state support for the LNG sector in Russia. The production of cryogenic equipment is progressing fast, but remain limited. Also, the Russian gas turbines for compression drive are limited to 32 megawatt maximum. The procurement of uh, equivalent electric motors, the variable frequency drive is problematic. Gazprom has signed a contract with Iran to procure gas turbines in the small scale size, and the external financing has been drastically reduced, if not completely stopped. And last but not least, the Arctic Cascade scalability to 2.5 million ton capacity and beyond is not proven. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much for you such an insightful presentation, Matthew. Uh, it's, it's really uh, a lot of information to process, but this, you have done it so well. Yeah, we have a, a, a few questions here, two questions that are quite technical and another not technical. The first one is, do you think that uh, the project Arctic LNG 2, train 1 can be achieved, start up in 2023 as it has been announced. Yes, so we have seen the, the, the Novatec has been scrambling different kind of uh, solutions to, 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 to ensure that the startup will be on, the, on time in December 2023. There are many question marks, especially on the towing of the huge GBS-1 which before was supposed to be carried out with the Dutch support, but now Dutch support is no more because of the sanctions. There is also a question mark on the uh, availability of the floating power plant. It was supposed to be, I think, 125 megawatt for train one and 400 megawatt for uh, train two. 
However, this uh, specialized unit uh, need to be uh, winterized to resist uh, the harsh uh, Arctic weather. And uh, I haven't heard anything happening so far. So uh, it looks like the uh, December 2023 date is not uh, possible. Okay, thank you so much. The You're next welcome. question is uh, more really more technical and is related to what is the future prospect of Novatec Arctic Cascade process? Yes, so the Arctic Cascade itself is a it's a it's a it's a good process. It's working well. The issues was more on the supplier side and the uh, OEM manufacturers of uh, cryogenic equipment. So there have been a lot of feedback on the Yamal LNG Trade 4, and those suppliers ha have learned a lot. So the, I think they have they started including lessons learned from uh, Yamal LNG Trade 4 to move to the next step, which is the Opsky LNG uh, project from Novatec again. It's a two train of 2.5 million ton each, so for a total of 5 million tons. So uh, there has been significant uh, support from the Russian state for the launch of this project. And the FID just recently announced by uh, the CEO of Novatec, uh, Leonid Mikkelsen, he announced the FID will, be, will happen uh, next year. So I think, yes, the, the Arctic Cascade is scalable up to 2.5. Beyond that, uh, I don't think so. Excellent. Last question, and this is just a measuring your pulse on the news, Mehdi. And is the, do you see uh, or foresee any maintenance maintaining problem at any liquefaction terminal? Yes. 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 I'm receiving uh, this question a lot. So uh, uh, we have to know something that Russians they have the expertise to operate and to maintain their, uh, their uh, energy facilities. There is an issue of spare parts, availability and supply, especially for the, for the gas turbines, for the DCS systems, for so many uh, systems that are embedded into a, uh, an LNG plant and uh, they need to work perfectly to, to ensure production. But I always go back to the, to the example of the gas turbine because this is one critical piece of equipment uh, Russian have the expertise to continue operating the, those machines. And uh, we all know that uh, sourcing spare parts from the market would, would not be an issue. There are so many sources. This is for the uh, frame 7 and frame 5. However, if we talk about the LM9000, which is a latest product from Baker Hughes, this is a problem because there is no, no equivalent in the market right now. And it will be a huge problem for to operate in the future. Well, with that, we wrap up your presentation. You're uh, most welcome. Thank you. No, thank you enough for you to join in this My session pleasure. and closing this uh, event for uh, from today. So.